detection theory, we talked about last time before I move on to, um, to, um, to this lecture on receiver field. And then what? Now, um, I just want to go over th this basic concept that I might wonder through uh, rather quickly um, on Wednesday. Uh, receiver f I mean, the, the, the concept of the uh, security detection theory. Uh, and many of you must have had, yes. You can hear me? Okay, so let me see if. Um, Uh, I, I might have to turn this on to. Um, I might have to get this on to get a volume on. Okay, it's a, hey, one of them is. Okay, yeah, this is okay now. Okay, so I, I'll leave the. Uh, this is okay. Get on. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'll leave the uh, screen up for a little bit so that I can use breakboard. Okay, so, so here, here is the uh, basic concept. Again, uh, let me emphasize, this is a fu fundamentally important concept to many of things that you are running to down the road. So I wanna make sure that you understand it. Oh, sorry about that. So, so we start, we use the example that I, I, I used the last uh, Wednesday of seeing for you to detecting the presence of a gray colored square on a white background. And that is the basic uh, formula for us to discuss this. And, and we said, um, if I were to plot the probability density function of the background of that screen, the brightness, it would be something we assume is Gaussian distribution. With, with particular mean. We call this noise. You can call it something else. Then when I present a square on that, square has certain um, a darkness on that. So it would be, uh, brightness would be changed, and that distribution is some second distribution because it shifted the mean of the background. And uh, we call this signal plus noise. And that's the second distribution. That's two distributions we work with. Uh, this is a, a probability density function. And this will be a variable that, is, that, is, that it will measure. So that means that whenever you see a spot on the screen, your, 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 visual, your brain, through your visual system, samples the darkness. And then what I jump to quickly, and, and some of you uh, sh should have maybe asked questions that this is the physical property of the screen, darkness, brightness we talk about. But uh, when your visual system, when you bring, make decision, you make a decision not directly on this, but uh, on the neuron representation of this, which uh, I defer, we, we'll discuss it later on. But, but let me say this way. So we also talk about this concept. This stimulus coming in, and this is your brain, this is your uh, behavior or decision. So inside your brain, this two distribution is transformed to, uh, similarly, for simplicity, another two distribution. Now, we call this R now. So this is luminous, or some physical measure of screen. And this will be fine rate of neurons that we we'll discuss today. But of course, conceptually, you can consider this is transformed to this. This is still a noise, but rather uh, the fine rate of noise. This is a fine rate of noise. This is fine rate of noise plus signal. So we simply transform this two distribution to another domain. Yes. Can you fix your mic? Sorry. What's that? Can you fix your microphone? Uh, I'm sorry. It, it, okay. Is this is this better? Uh, let me just hold it. It's, it's, it's start cracking. Uh, so, um, so the concept of this, we, we for the simplicity now we linear transform. So, for when you bring make decision, you bring uh, make decision based on neurons somewhere. Let's see. Um, 
summary, there's a neuron here. This is similar. Your brain make decision of a two distribution that based on final rate of a neuron. Okay. But the mathematics I'm asking you to understand an excess on uh, doesn't change whether you operate on this or operate on that. Okay. So for simplicity, we'll operate on this, assuming this is a situation that is going to transform something like this. That's the first point I want to uh, get it to. Is, is that clear? But the fact is, actually, the brain has a multiple stages before you make a decision on whether you will see something on the screen. So therefore, there will be multiple transformation of what we start here. Okay. And that transformation could pull these things further apart or further closer. But those are details that we'll work on later on. Okay, before, because when, when the screen hits your eye, your retina generates representation. And then that goes through to a visual cortex, primary visual cortex, that generates another representation. Let's go to a secondary visual cortex, eventually goes to a frontal cortex. So when you make a decision with a country finger, say, yeah, I see it. A decision was made on the last stage. So the cascade of representation uh, that, that we're talking about. And I want to clarify that. But, but basically, the interpreting you have to work on from here on. That's the first point. Second point I want to clarify is that uh, I went through uh, this last Wednesday, this previous Wednesday. Now, once you have these two distribution, one single noise, single noise, then you make a decision on whether you see a signal or not. Uh, based on a threshold you set up here, we call it beta. That is, we call it a decision criteria or decision threshold. And your brain, when you make a decision, it's implied the threshold inside. A student asked me a good question afterwards, that how do we measure that threshold? That threshold, you cannot measure directly because that eventually depends. If this is a final neural representation you bring right on, that is a decision here. It's, it's R. That's equivalent to beta, function of beta there, right? Uh, unless we insert the electrode, if you were to insert the electrode in your brain, measuring from a neuron that allow you to make the decision, yes, there's an area of the brain, and uh, there are neurons there, actually, their firing allow you to make a decision or not. Then we will measure this. But by and large, for the experiment exercise you're doing now, we do not have a direct measurement here, but we can, we can infer that from the analysis that we do. Okay, from the analysis that we do. So uh, the important thing is that once you decide to set up a threshold here, and then you can compute the probability of how, how, how accurately you can detect it, and how much force alarm, how much, what is the miss. So all those are four probabilities. That is, if there is a signal there, and you make a decision, say there is a signal, then that is the, the probability, on the, that is the error on this curve, this is the probability of detection or hit. And then of course, if there is no signal, you make a decision, you go this this presentation, that's probability of a force alarm. And those are two most important properties among uh, other things here. And, and, and we said that if you plot those two probability, um, if you plot those two probability here, and uh, you can plot either way, this uh, probability detection, probability force alarm, and uh, this one, zero, zero, one, then this diagonal line, then you have a curve like that. All right. And, and then any decision you make, any beta you choose, will generate a point here. This is for particular beta. And then once you move this about that way or this way, you move along this axis. So that is the relationship we discussed. And I, 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 I suggest that you go over this again and again, fully understand uh, what is this, this curve represent in this, uh, in this picture. Okay. And, and then, and then, then that, that's, that's, I think, what we want to talk about. Is that clear? Okay. So we're about to give you homework today. I think we have posted uh, in this homework, there are uh, three parts. For first two parts, 
you are asked to, to make psychomedical functions that we discussed uh, on Monday. And then the third part, you are asked to use the signal detection theory to, um, to do exercise. Okay, so that's what I'll emphasize on here. So let's start. Now this doesn't come down. Let me ask. Sorry, let me let me start let me start this again. It's just Why does this start again? <laughs> yes, somehow I went back, didn't want to do it again. Did you do the route? Yeah, I did a route. There's a certain thing. No, that lab at two. I okay. use lab at two. It show up here. Oh, okay. but, but it doesn't start doing. Um, oh, shoot. Maybe it's we warm up. Not again. Oh, oh okay. For some reason, leaving a lot and doing it over and over. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> anyway. This they need to warm up. Okay, so what are we gonna discuss today, beginning today, first, it, sorry, this thing doesn't work too well. So bear with me one moment, and let me see if you can. Okay, this is better. So we're gonna discuss first today the concept of receptive field. Now, um, this is a summary of what I just went through and what I went through Wednesday. Okay, and if you have further questions, uh, be sure you uh, discuss with the TAs in the sessions. This is an extremely important concept. So, uh, what we're going to talk about today is this concept of a receptive field, and then following that, we'll discuss how the representation of a signal by nervous system action potentials. Now, this is a very important concept because for engineers, um, if you see neuron as a process, as a filter, and the stimulus coming, if it's an X of T, and a neuron will generate an action potential, which you are familiar with. And uh, this, if this is a linear system, we call it impulse response or transfer function. And, uh, and uh, uh, that's an engineering term, but for biology, this is what I call the receptive field. So receptive field essentially there's, is describe a sensory neuron's response to the external stimulus. Okay. Now, how do we measure, measure receptive field? So I will use a, um, a couple examples from different sensory modality. So in this class, you will learn auditory system, visual system, some sensory system, and a vestibular system. All of them this concept will apply. So uh, suppose uh, we're looking at the neuron in the somatosensory cortex somewhere here, and uh, don't worry about details. So later on, we'll come to study this in greater detail. If we drop the electrode here, <coughs> record a neuron firing, and then um, some part of the skin, like here, will respond to touch, okay? So here is the experiment. You have the electrode here, record action potential that is shown here. If you touch particular, particular region of skin, as showed, I have this color here, uh, and the neuron would fire, would it have increased action potential. Okay, 
And then if you touch somewhere nearby in this darker green area, and you see there are fewer neurons, uh, fewer spikes. Each, each line here represents the action potential. Okay? And if you touch something far away, nothing happens here. Because what happened, this is a period of a touch. And here, why we have a spike here, that's called a spontaneous. So every single neuron in nervous system in your brain is doing something. No neuron is completely silent. In nervous system, there's a general universal rule. If there's no activity, you would die. So neuron would die if there's no activity. So spontaneously, even you do nothing, hear nothing, see nothing, neuron in your auditory system, visual system, will have this we call spontaneous firing. Okay? So these are spontaneous firing. That means if you touch here for this neuron, it's outside the receptive field, then the firing is spontaneous all the way through. So this is the receptive field of a neuron. Yes? Uh, no, um, no. Uh, each is because of some receptor in your skin that's being stimulated. Uh, whether you feel each or not, uh, you still have a spontaneous. And uh, we'll discuss the uh, difference between each touch, hot, cold, later on when we talk about sens some sensory system. Okay, each is one of the sensations carried by some sensory system. Okay, so this is the receptive field of a some sensory neuron. Okay, so what this tell you is that uh, this neuron we are recording here is uh, sensitive to the touch of this part of the skin. Now, of course, you can imagine other neurons will be sensitive to other parts touch of the skin. Okay, now um, why we want to study uh, some of the sensory system or uh, receptive through receptive field? Because this allows you to figure out, allow scientists to figure out how is our body skin represented in the brain. So if, if you were to move electrodes around this part of the brain systematically, you would find that they represent different parts of the body. Okay, this is part of the cortex. And this indicates if you drop a neuron here, you have a representation of your shoulder. And if you drop a neuron here, it would be one of the fin fingers would be responsive to touch. So receptive field represent the representation of the brain to the side. So essentially establish a relationship between your part of the brain and the outside. Now different color here indicate different cortical areas and we'll revisit, it. we'll revisit this later on when I come back to discuss some the sensory system. Now this is something called uh, uh, humunculus. So I don't know if you guys noticed a couple days ago uh, Google uh, in its website honored a scientist called uh, um, uh, um, Penfield. Did anyone notice a couple of days ago? You know, Google from time to time and, and, and highlight particular individuals uh, on their website. Yes? Okay, you know, it's good, good, thank you. Do you know, does anyone know who is Penfield? Penfield is, is a scientist who actually uh, produced this picture. So, so this is a picture we call homunculus. That is showing you proportionally uh, which part of your brain is devoted to which part of your skin. Now, you all notice that this is a very distorted person. So that means that uh, not every part of your skin is equally represented in the brain. This is a very interesting question that concerns the development, evolution, and plasticity we'll revisit later on. That means your finger is much more extensively represented than your toes. So you look at your finger here. So that's where how much your brain is devoted to your finger. It's the thumb uh, all the way to digital five, this much. Okay. And uh, so is your mouse. Okay, so is your mouse. A uh, mouse is somewhere, uh, somewhere where mouse is here. Now your toes is here. As your toes for the leg are not much represented here. Now, another thing interesting here, again, we're, I will just uh, plant the seeds now, we'll come to visit is that. Now, you think about this, this part of the brain from here to here is one dimensional, it's pretty linear from one end to another. Our body is not a linear, our body is a three dimensional space. So how does the brain represent and map this, right? So for example, if you look at finger here, one, two, three, four, five, that's one next to each other. That makes sense. My finger, second finger is to the first one, third to the second, so forth, so on. But look at what is next to the finger. What next to the thumb 
is, is what? Is your eyes, nose, and face. But if you look physically, between my finger and my, my eyes, nose, and face, there's a lot of things in between. Okay. So there's a quite interesting uh, reason and story behind this, how our brain evolved, connected to this. Uh, later on, we actually talk about a very interesting phenomenon called phantom limb. That is, uh, when someone lost your limb, you actually feel sensation of your last little finger, hand, on your face. And the people do not, would not understand this un until they have th this and that map. And this was done by uh, Winfield, uh, by Penfield. And Penfield was a physician scientist in uh, Montreal's Neurological Institute, one of the most famous neurological institutes in the world. And in 1918, he was a trained, he received his MD here from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. So he was one of our alumni. He was trained here, and eventually he became a physician scientist. In the 30s, 40s, in the 40s and 50s, he conducted a number of experiments in, 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 in the uh, human neurological patients while they underwent the surgery. He was able to insert the electrode in their brain and measure response to the skin touch, among other things. That is where he derived this. Now, this and this map is now become standard pictures in all the neuron physiological neuron science textbook in medical school, everyone study. That's work by Penfield. So, so I happened to notice a couple of days ago on, on Google, they actually acknowledge if you hit that button uh, of the Penfield uh, on the head, they will show you all the information um, behind this. I just want to mention that too. Now, uh, what about receptive field in other sensory uh, system, like auditory system, right? In some sensory system, receptive field is more um, intuitive. That is, is a part of a skin. What about in auditory system? In auditory system, that's what I described all the way here, receptive field is described by two dimensions. One dimension is frequency, another is intensity. Okay. Now, here is the receptive field of auditory neuron. That we will spend more time discuss this when I come back to discuss auditory system. That this neuron is sensitive to one frequency. And uh, what does this tell you is that uh, there are two properties of a receiver field. One is the frequency we call a characteristic frequency. Uh, why this characteristic frequency? This is a frequency that you can excite a neuron with a lower threshold. So this curve will indicate that if you stimulate anywhere within this, you will excite a neuron. That would mean this neuron would hear a sound. Outside, you will not, just like a part of a skin, except it will describe this two-dimensional domain. Okay. And, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll talk about more later on uh, for this. Now, uh, that's one neuron. Of course, the neurons are sensitive to different frequencies. This is the number of neurons. This is sensitive to frequency here. Uh, this is the highest way, uh, gradually higher, higher. Okay. How many of those neurons in our ear? There are about 35,000 neurons in our ear. Each of them is sensitive to very low frequency, lowest frequency we can hear, about 50 hertz. To highest frequency we can hear, about 20 some kilohertz. So all of that hearing is guaranteed by, by this neuron. So in the auditory system, oops, um, uh, that is a receiver field. Okay. Uh, one property of this is that um, how do you define a receiver field? It depends on the criteria you use. Okay. When I use that example for touch of a sensory neuron, I say there is a receiver field here. There's a certain size, let's say five square meters, square centimeters, five square centimeters. But how do you decide it's a five, not a three, not a six? It depends on how heavy you touch. Okay. If you touch lightly, you can imagine, you will identify a small field. If you touch heavily, a big one. So the size of a receiver field is relative. It depends on the threshold the criteria. And the, for example, for the outer neuron we talk about here, and the, re the way you derive every point of here is that you start with the frequency, you gradually increase the sound level, loudness, until the neuron began to fire. Then you say, ha, huh, that's my threshold. But what do you mean by neuron began to fire? Work diggers more in my, in my uh, the next year. That is, you have to measure neurons firing rate. I just said earlier that each neuron has a spontaneous firing rate. So if you do nothing, you play no sound, neuron will fire ba 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 you know, a couple of spikes per second. Then you give it a sound, the spike would increase. 
So when do you call that increase significant enough as a threshold is your criteria. Okay, is your criteria. So for example, in this case, we use 10 spike per second as our criteria. If increase of firing is 10 spikes per second more than background, we say we excited this neuron. Then that's where you get a point. But if you increase your threshold to 58 spike per second, then you get another threshold. So for some. So that is the property of a receiver field. Now, uh, given you have, um, so, so this indicates that if you keep increasing your threshold, your size will become smaller and smaller. Now, here, here's an example that can relate your bike to your, um, to, 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 the, um, to the signal detection and psychometric function we just studied. So let me walk you backward. Okay, walk your bike here. So this is a recipient field of, of uh, a neuron. But you can also generalize this as your hearing threshold, okay? And in fact, your hearing threshold, what you can hear is more or less is like this, but start from lower here. Now, suppose I give you an example here, say, um, this derive an um, experiment to measure this threshold of your hearing, or what you can hear at two kilohertz. If, you, if I ask you to derive a psychophysical experiment to measure hearing threshold at the two kilohertz, how would you do it? Yeah. Play some sound at two kilohertz, but at different intensities. Right. If you play a number of sound at two hertz with different intensity, from low, that below your hearing, to high, and randomize this. Okay. If you let's say play uh, ten sound. Uh, each is from, let's say, 20 dB and 22 all the way to maybe 30 some dB, bracket your actual threshold and randomize this. Then that is, that's the psychometric function for you to determine that threshold. Okay, so, so that, that's why, why we uh, introduce that example here. So, so let's move on to uh, talk about this. So that's what I, uh, I mentioned earlier. So for, for humans, this is our threshold of hearing. We call it audiogram. Okay, what I just show you in previous slides is a, is a recipient of a single neuron, but many neurons together give rise to hear. So what you can see here, for humans, our hearing threshold start from about, you know, about, you can go all the way here, from here to here. So it means that it, around here, about one, two, three, four kilohertz where our speech is located, our threshold is very low, we can hear very sensitively. Okay. As you move to lower frequency, your threshold increase, also high frequency threshold increase. Okay. Yes? Uh, if I were at like next to a jet engine and it made a really loud sound, I could damage my hearing. Yes, you but could. You would. If it made a really loud sound at a very high, very low frequency, yeah. would it have to be more powerful to damage my hearing? That's right. For, for a frequency of extremely low, for sound with extremely low frequency or high frequency, it will have to be much louder uh, to, to, for you to hear, for you to suffer uh, damage. And uh, if you stay next to jet engine all the time, you, you might, uh, might notice in the airport, and uh, when you sit on an airplane, look at people on the ground, the ground stuff, that as are here, we've hand the guided airplane, they all have this uh, ear protection. That's crucial, because if you're exposed to um, audio, uh, noise for too long, actually it won't take very long. It's scary if you know the literature, how long it takes, how short it takes to cause it, uh, damage. Uh, you have damage. And, and also, uh, I don't know how many of you, maybe too late to ask the question now, I mean, how many of you have gone to a um, rock concert? Um, a lot of you. Unfortunately, uh, the very loud sound they play rock concert is close to 100 dB. It's no good to your ear at all. So. If, yes? All frequency. Yeah, all frequency. They, they st if you play, for example, let's say your hearing threshold near uh, a 0 dB, right? So if you play a 60 dB sound at 2 kilohertz, that's a 6 dB above threshold. So that means they, when this is no, uh, a threshold though, that means the neuron here, neuron uh, at 2 kilohertz, example we show, would be sensitive to about 0 dB. 
If you play 6 dB, those neurons will be excited by sound 6 dB above their threshold. But the same 6 dB for the neuron tuned to 300 Hz is better at threshold. So that's why actually rock concert is bad because that's, they play pretty much in the middle frequency range. There are some very high frequency sound beamed by electronics other things like we can barely hear and because, because our threshold is very high. Uh, I mean, because the threshold at high sound, for example, 20 kilohertz is pretty high. It will really take a lot more energy to excite it. That's one thing. The second thing is as you grow older, you're all young. If you, you know, if you, next time if you, you know, talk to your parents or grandparents, if you're old enough, you'll notice that they start, uh, I mean, they'll, they'll lose sensitivity, particularly high frequency. As we grow older, this upper age of hearing will begin to move lower and lower. Okay move lower and lower until a point where you, you could not hear. That's why the older people have a, a difficulty hearing subtlety in your voice, uh, particularly in a noisy environment, in a in bar, in a restaurant, uh, because this hearing, uh, upper part of hearing continue to decrease. But the point of here is that uh, um, this, uh, this threshold measurement of hearing uh, it represents what we can sense outside. And, uh, and uh, the way to measure here is each of the points can be measured by psychometrical function that you could now uh, develop. Um, that's the question I just asked you earlier. How do you measure a threshold here? Okay. Now, uh, what about a visual system? Uh, the recipient of visual system is, can be uh, measured like this. For example, um, I just use a cat visual cortex example. Uh, if you drop an electrode in V1, record what it recipient field is. Uh, the recipient field of many V1 neurons are sensitive to orientation, okay? Orientation. Uh, now, if you play this bar, this is a, a bar, like a vertically, response is maximum, uh, and otherwise is minimum. And you can plot the number of uh, action potential within a time period. We call it fine rate of spike rate, which I'll touch upon in a few minutes. Y you got this. Okay, that's risk few. So that means this bar means the following. If you move something like this, and this is moving something like this, okay, that's a visual recipe field that sensitive orientation. So the point for this example is that recipe field is not about just the area of the skin or frequency. It's, that's two different, in visual system, it could be about orientation. Then the, the other system, it could be something else. But the point is that recipe field is made of uh, physical parameters in a phys uh, physical domain that uh, describe how neuron will respond to that domain. Okay, it varies between uh, systems. Now, um, it also matters um, that how large the receiver field is, uh, that how well we can sense external world. Here is example showing you um, the density and the size of receptivity, how that matters and what we see. So this is what we normally see in uh, Yosemite, right? I think many of you probably have been there. You can see this is a dome, Yosemite is a rock there. So this is close to what a human eye would see. Our human eye has a lot of receptivity and each of them have a small. But if we do a simulation where we reduce the number of receptors, that is increase the size of each, eventually you would get this. Uh, if you look through the eyes of a, a rodent, a mouse, this is pretty much what a mouse would see in Yosemite. Okay, because the mouse visual system is very poor. Recipient field is large and, and sparse. Okay, and this one. Now, another example, um, perhaps is on the finger. It's more, more intuitive it's here that you can, we can demonstrate. Now, if you look at the recipient field, um, on, our, on our body parts, um, for example, in, in, the, um, in the fingers, fingertip. And the fingertip has the smallest receptor field in the somatosensory system, most sensitive here. Uh, maybe next one is, is, is the lip, but lip is hard to do experiments, so we use the finger as an example. And if you look at receptor field here on, on your waist, it's much larger. So what does that mean? That means that if you do the following experiment, that could two-point discrimination, if you put two point, two stimulus, two touch on your finger versus here, you will feel, uh, you will feel very different. So, so just, just 
to draw this to a home. So I'm going to do a demo and find the um, volunteer. Um, would you mind just come here? So now I'll just show you um, what, what, how you may not realize how sensitive, how insensitive, which part of it. So I'm going to ask him to um, stick his finger out. I'll do that experiment. He will stick a finger out, and then you don't look at me, look elsewhere. And I'm going to put one, one touch, or one or two. You told me I touch your finger by one or two, OK? One. Two. OK, that's very easy. Because when I put a two here, the close I can put, is larger than one wrist per foot. Now I'm going to do this on your wrist, and, and um, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> All right? Okay, tell me one or two. Two. One. Okay. Most time was two. Oh, okay. I, I, <laughs> I, I randomized it. So. Oh, okay. But, but you can do this very easily. In fact, the, the, the even larger super feeder is on your back. Okay. If you, you can do this, uh, you know, your, your classmates, other things. If you turn back, you put a stick on one finger, two finger. You'll be surprised uh, how bad you are. All right. Uh, and then, now this, this, this um, is a very good demonstration of the size of a super field and the sensitivity of our body. So as I showed here, so the, at your fingertip, um, this is explaining how he feels, honestly, reporting. And the recipient size, you look here, is, is about a th three millimeter. Okay, the two pens I can put it close together, it's about five millimeter. I cannot go closer for, for this rough demonstration. Now, on your, uh, on your lower arm, you can see uh, it's actually 30 some millimeter. So I, he actually did very well for the first time. I put about 15 millimeter. I thought he would not feel, but you actually feel it too. But second time, we'll make it a little closer. But on your back, you say if even worse. Your shoulder is not good at all of a kid. Okay. So this is a two-point discrimination threshold of all your body parts. The way to do that is to deliver one or two with a various distance between the two until the point where a person cannot tell is two. Okay, you can design a physical experiment. So this is showing very nicely uh, how our body uh, is structured and how the receptive field is organized for us to sense where we need to sense most. And that's because we use finger far more uh, extensively as primates than others. Okay, so that is the first uh, part of what I want to describe. That's very qualitatively is a concept of a receptive field. Uh, in, in, in the coming lectures um, on auditory, visual, and the somatosensory system, we'll apply that concept of recipient field and talk about more uh, how recipient field is constructed by nerves uh, firing. Yes. This one, yes. Very good question. So if I were to put the same thing for, for other animal species, it would be very different. For example, the most noticeable is the finger. Okay. Actually, when I was a postdoc, I studied the uh, somatosensory system of both the monkeys and the rodents. So in humans, if you notice here, humans, our five fingers are very finely tuned. Okay. In fact, in that human, uh, uh, humanculus, that, that picture shows you, in, in our brain, five fingers, is, each of them has one re area represented. But in rodents, like mouse or rats, they also have five fingers. But if you, if, you do, if you were to measure the receptive field, it's not fine at all. It's very large. And in the cortex, there are five fingers that are represented together. That reflects, when you ask evolution, it's a very good question, uh, how we use finger. Uh, if you ever, I don't know if you guys ever uh, observe how, they, how a mouse uh, uses their finger. They just do this, right? They, if you put a pellet there, if you have done experimenting in the lab, put a pellet in a small wheel, mouse will go there to grab this here. And the humans and the non primates are, and the one of you, uh, part of the species that use finger, in, we use our five finger independently. That's why we, we develop this. And the f uh, there's a fine, small recipe. But for the same token, for the same token, uh, look at our toes. We also have five toes, all right? But for us, 
arteries. You see how bad arteries. I mean, I, years ago, I, I went through the uh, neurological exam and where they test the toe, how sensitive your toes. Actually, this is long before I become a neuroscientist. I have no, no clue why they want to test the sensitivity of my toe. I was applying for Air, um, Air Force pilot. As one of the exam goes, so you ask you to lie down there, take out your shoes, take out your socks, you put, stick it there, then take a Q-tip. They took, took a Q-tips. They loosen up the tip a little bit. Then light to touch one of the toes, they say, tell me which toe I touched. It's very difficult. So next time, after the bath, when your feet is clean, you try this with your roommate. <laughs> <laughs> very difficult. If you're surprised, you have no idea which of your toes has been touched. So our discrimination between this, between our toes is very bad, as, as you can see from here. It's very bad. Where's fingers is very good. Yeah, good question. So think of when evolution is a very important problem behind everything we're talking. By and large, we talk about humans, but most of the neuroscience literature are based on animals. So keep that in mind, whenever we talk about neuroscience literature, by and large, we use animal studies. But we use the example from humans because it's more intuitive, it's more medically relevant. But there's difference, and we'll, we'll point out difference as, as we encounter them. Any other questions? Yes. Um, for most of the time, left side in, in the summer census, there's no systematic difference. So in terms of receptive field, is that what you mean? In terms of this, this kind of measurement, no. As far as we know, there's no difference. The brain's control of left side, right side has some difference we'll talk about. But this type of measurement, in general, unless someone has a dysfunction, in normal people, there's no noticeable left and right difference. And, and the people have a right hand and left hand in terms of their motor movement. But that has not been shown applied to threshold of fingers. For skin, that's the most In motor system, good question. The motor system, there's a left hand, right hand is a difference. Most people are right handed, uh, by another statistically. A number of people, maybe about 70% 70, 70 of people, population is right handed. But 25 to 30, 25 population, 25% of population is left handed. There are some mixtures. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, this is actually a very useful figure to do. You know. Okay. So what I'm going to continue, I'll start this and continue to finish on um, next Monday. It's a very important problem. Is that is a, how, do we, how do we quantify neural firing? Okay. The receptive field I just described is very superficial. That subject we can come back visit again and again in, in many more lectures coming in your semester. So here's the thing. So we say that you have a neuron somewhere in your brain, a sensor neuron whether it's auto or visual or sensory, it doesn't matter. When you stimulate that sensory system, a neuron become excited, become a fire or discharge. This all means the same thing. The neuron give out action potentials. And this is action potential we also call it spikes for, for, for sure. Most time in the literature, people just call it spikes. Formally, we call it action potentials. And we, we, we also call a sequence of action potentials as a spike trends. So we might use those interchangeably. So how do, how do you measure action potential spike trends in the nervous system? Here I'll show you how to measure. So if there's a neuron here, uh, by now I think you, are, uh, you all are familiar with the notion, a neuron would have a cell body or soma, and it has an axon that sends the action potential to the next target neuron. Then it would have many dendrites that receive inputs from here, right? Now, uh, the way scientists study neuron, most time is from a soma, because the soma is the easiest one part of a neuron to study. If you take a microelectrode, you <coughs> place it close enough to a neuron, then you measure the potential, relative potential between that and the ground. Then you will have, you will have something like this. Okay. Now, what I'm showing here is that if this electrode is inserted into the soma, cross the memory. So in your soma, it's like this hollow. There's a memory. If you cross inside, record from inside, that called intracellular recording. It will show transmembrane potentials that you are familiar with, as well as action potentials. Now, but recording from inside neuron is actually very difficult because this neuron is only about 50 microns below map. 50 microns, tiny, and brain's moving. To drop an electrode inside is extremely difficult. So most time, a scientist just place the electrode outside, somewhere close by. 
they will pick up something we call extracellular recording, and those has action potential of spikes. Now you can also do intracellular recording on axon. That's extremely, extremely difficult. So the two type of recording we're gonna deal with in the lectures uh, that comes. One is intracellular recording, one is extracellular recording. Okay, that describes where the signal are obtained. Now, there are also uh, two other uh, notions here. One is called in vivo. That means you record from an intact brain, the entirety, brain's entirety is functioning alive. You take data there. And there is quite often, uh, scientists study signals in brain, size of a brain in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a dishes, or as a neuron, or called in vitro. These are in vivo, in vitro. Okay. Now, if we record a signal like this, how do you process here? So I'm gonna now walk you through uh, these spike trends you, uh, you would obtain from the run, how to analyze, quantify, and uh, model this. This is the goal for remaining, um, my remaining lecture today and, uh, and, and the next week. So if you were to record a real neuron from a uh, brain, what does it look like? Here are an example of a real action potential sequence or spectrums that in my laboratory record from brain of uh, an animal. In the cortex, if you drop an around electrode there, and, uh, and in this case, we actually play a sound, long sequence of a sound, tone, ooh, it's like this. This neuron is in outer cortex, so it gives many, many action potentials. Okay, each of them action potential because that part is so compressed, so you don't see a waveform, but you will see waveform in the next slides here. So if you expand the recording like that, you will get something like this. It's actually a raw signal would be like this. There's action potential here. There's a slowly ongoing, you know, up and down fluctuation because the brain, every neuron is firing. So all together, there's a sum of the potential that our brain goes up and down in, in, in terms of voltage. So the way you analyze this is the following. First, since you're an engineer, you know you can design a high pass filter to figure out the slow wave, you will get this. Then, for each of this, you take the piece of our, grab that out, and that is this. So this is a one millisecond window that here. Now, this is many, many, many seconds, okay? So each of this line, if you expand it into scale, is this. So that's action potential you have seen before, okay? Now, later on of the semester, and, and you guys work would do a laboratory. I will run SBE2 live, action potential conduction velocity. So for which we actually study this action potential a bit more experimentally, okay? Now, uh, um, you probably all know that action potential has particular properties. One of the most important properties of action potential is that it's all or none, right? You guys all know this. It's all or none. That means either you have one action potential or no action potential. There's no half, no quarter, okay? Because